What a blessing to be here on the West Coast. Um, it is my first time ministering on the West Coast. It actually is. Yeah, it's uh, groundbreaking. groundbreaking. Let's go. Let's go. So, whew, amen. So I know they asked earlier, but just so I can get a, get a good idea, how many people are here tonight that were not here for last night's session? Could you just raise your hand just because I want to get a feel for, okay, quite a few, quite a few people that were not here for last night's session. Okay, just helps me kind of gauge what, what was already taught and not and <clears throat> all that. So I want to open in prayer, and then we're going to dive into the Word and go into some, some ministry and, yeah, just really uh, just believe the Holy Spirit's going to move through this time in the teaching and in the ministry. And uh, so let's just fix our eyes on Him. Father, I thank You. God, I thank You for Your goodness. I thank You, God that you are here in our midst, as we've already been saying and praying and singing. God, I thank you that you are a God who comes close to us, who lives inside of us by your Spirit, Father. I thank you that you made the way through Jesus. I thank you that you shed your blood, Jesus, to tear that veil so that we could know you in a personal way, Lord, so that we could be redeemed and forgiven. And so, Father, we just declare, God, that your kingdom is at hand in this room in our midst, Jesus, would you walk among us? Would you move among us? Lord, I ask for the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to be released, Father. God, even through the teaching, Lord, I pray for encounters with you. I pray for sovereign encounters with you, God. Even in the time of preaching and teaching of your word, would you visit people, God? Would you speak to people? Lord, would you break chains of bondage and affliction and oppression and torment in Jesus' name? You are the deliverer, Jesus. Would you walk among us? Holy Spirit, I welcome you to do what you do, to break the yoke. God, we give you this evening. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing and how you're moving. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to be in the Gospel of John here in a couple minutes. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to John chapter 11. Uh, we're going to be... Looking at a couple verses there toward the end of that uh, chapter, starting at verse 43 here in just a minute or two. So if you were here uh, last night, many of you were here last night. I'm not going to re-preach that message, but just give a maybe a two-minute synopsis. Uh, just did a little introduction to deliverance. And that word deliverance, what does that even mean? Well, it means casting out evil spirits. It means breaking the chains of demonic influence. And we talked about, I kind of shared my story and my background of how God really kind of sovereignly led me into this ministry. It wasn't part of my church background or, or history, but God has, has a way of, of taking us and bringing us into new things. And here's the reality. When we come across something in the scriptures, in the word of God, that is different than what we maybe grew up with, different than maybe our church tradition is, then we have a decision to make. We, we're, we're at a fork in the road, right? Like I remember the first time I ever went to a, a gathering where there was truly spirit-filled worship happening. Because, again, in my church background, there, there was no really moving of the Spirit and belief in the gifts of the Spirit. That wasn't part of the, the background, and so uh, the worship was not very expressive. You never saw anyone lifting their hands or, or dancing or you know, expressing worship. And I remember I, um, I was at Johns Hopkins University. It's where I went to undergrad, and there was a couple different churches and campus ministries that brought in Jason Upton. Now, I heard him playing here uh, last, last night when I walked in. I heard it playing on the recording. And so it kind of took me back. But uh, Jason Upton, if you know who he is, he's a very, like, prophetic, you know, spirit-filled, like, just worship leader. And so uh, some campus ministers and some churches brought him in. And I remember being in that service, and I'm thinking, what in the world is going on here? Right? I mean, just, I'd never seen such expression of worship, such, you know, hands lifted and, and dancing and all this, all this going on. But... I had to make a decision. Just because it was something that I did not grow up with does not mean it's normal, not normal, according to God's word. Right? When, when I look at God's word, I see things like lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Right? I see things like shout out to God with a voice of triumph. I, I see things like praise him with dancing. Right? And so even if I'm not comfortable with that, or even if I didn't grow up with that, 
I have to choose to come into alignment with God's word. God doesn't come into alignment with my background or church tradition. I come into alignment with God's word and God's kingdom. Right? And the same thing is true when it comes to this area of deliverance. Because it can feel so strange to us because maybe we've never heard it, we've never seen it. And, and so we have all these question marks and we're wondering, is this even, you know, is this real? Is this biblical? Is all this? But when you dive into the Gospels, when you dive into the Scriptures, again, you see, like I shared last night, it was something that Jesus did on a regular basis. And so... Some people think, man, you know, you're, getting, you're, you're kind of getting out there. You're, you know, if you, if you go into this deliverance stuff, you might start getting all weird or crazy or out of balance, right? People think you're going to get out of balance. And I, I get it. There is a need for the right balance, right? And sometimes things have been done in maybe extreme ways or unbiblical ways, and maybe it kind of turns us off to this topic. But the reality is we're already way out of balance, Because it was as common for Jesus to cast out a demon as it was for him to preach a sermon. Remember I said that last night? Mark 1.39, he was preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And so if we're going to have true balance, we have a long way to go to get that pendulum back where it needs to be, right? Right? And so if we are uncomfortable with this topic, we need to wrestle through it and dive into the scriptures and, and think, man, what would it have been like following Jesus around? What would it, what would it have been like going, to, going with him to the synagogue and going with him to the marketplaces, going with him to the homes and seeing this happen on a regular basis? And so last night we covered a couple different truths, five different truths about demonic influence. Demonic influence is real. Demonic influence is common, not rare. We talked about how there's certain things that can open the door to demonic influence. We talked about how Christians can need deliverance from evil spirits. It doesn't mean you're possessed, but there can be areas of your life that have come under demonic influence. And we talked about how Christians, believers, have authority over evil spirits. It means we don't need to be afraid of demons. We do not need to be afraid of demons. The the, the fact of the matter is demons are afraid of Christ in you. But, 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 but they try to use fear or confusion or maybe a misunderstanding or an ignorance of this topic to keep us from actually going after it because they want to be left alone. So we, we, we covered some of those areas. We went into a ministry time last night. And tonight I want to talk about removing the grave clothes. Removing the grave clothes comes from the story of Lazarus. And we're going to cover a couple different types of Several different types of demonic influence. So in John chapter 11, starting at verse uh, verse 43, this is at the time in the story, if you know the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, you'll know that Jesus intentionally waited for Lazarus to to actually to die so he could go and raise him from the dead. Mary and Martha had called and said, you know, your, your, um, your friend who you love, he's sick, please come and heal him. And Jesus waited, he waited, and eventually Lazarus died. And then he waited several days, and by the time he got there, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. So he was very dead, right? He was, he was there's dead, and then there's, you're really dead, right? He was, he was at that point. He was decaying. So, I mean, it, this, was, this was the impossible, right? Jesus waited to where no human way was it possible for him to be raised from the dead. And he gets to the, to the scene, and everyone's mourning, everyone's weeping and crying, and, and, they, and, and, and Martha comes and said, Lord, if you would have been here, you know, he would have been raised from the dead. And, and they had these interactions like this, and then eventually he gets to the tomb, and here's what he says in verse 43. When he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach from this story kind of symbolically here, using this as a symbolic picture, a prophetic picture of salvation and deliverance and the importance of this area of deliverance, of getting free from demonic influence. 
And you'll notice in that story that Jesus actually gave two commands total in that process. Right? He gets to the tomb. He's standing there. And the first command he gave is very simple. Lazarus, come forth. And that is the command that raised him from the dead. After being in the tomb four days, he, comes, he emerges from the tomb. His heart is beating. Blood is flowing through his veins. He's alive. But it describes him this way. It says he was bound. He was bound. His hands were bound. His feet were bound. His face was wrapped up in grave clothes. And I believe that that is a picture. Those two commands, the second one was loose him and let him go. First one, Lazarus, come forth. Second one, loose him and let him go. And they unbound him from the, from the, the, the grave clothes. I believe that's a symbolic picture of salvation and deliverance. Because Scripture says this. It says in uh, Ephesians Chapter 2, I believe it is, it says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Before coming to Christ, before our salvation, we're actually dead spiritually. We're as dead as Lazarus was in the tomb, unable to save ourselves, unable to get out of the grave. Spiritually speaking, we could be alive physically, but you can be dead spiritually. And that's why Jesus said you must be born again. When you're born again, the Spirit of God comes to indwell you. Your human spirit comes to life. You're resurrected. Salvation is not only going from, uh, you know, in, in sin to being forgiven of your sin. It's going from death to life spiritually. Being dead to being raised. And so, so, la- so there's a picture of our salvation. When Jesus saves us, we're raised to life, having been dead in our trespasses, having been dead in our sins. We're raised to life. But even though Lazarus was completely alive, his heart was beating, life was now in him, he wasn't able to function the way a normal person would have been able to function. He wasn't able to function the way he was supposed to function as long as he's still bound up and tied up. And what I found is that so many cases, believers find themselves, like Lazarus, in between the two commands. In between the first one and the second one, where they're alive from the dead spiritually, but they're not experiencing the full freedom that Jesus came to give us. They're alive from the dead. So they know that their sins are forgiven. They know that they've been born again. They know that they're on their way to heaven. They've been given eternal life. But there's certain areas of their life where the grave closed, the effects of death, the effects of the past, the effects of their maybe their past sin or hurts that have happened or various situations are still wrapped around them. And so they can't move forward into everything God has. They can't run the race. Your feet are tied up. You can't run the race with endurance that is set before you because your feet are tied up. You can't serve the way you're meant to serve in God's kingdom. Why? Because your hands are tied up. So you can't do, you, you can't know God and walk with him in that intimacy like you're supposed to. Why? Because your face is wrapped up. Your identity is, 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 is taken over, Right? And so many people find themselves in that situation. I said this last night. I'll say it again. God never intended salvation without deliverance. He never intended us to experience forgiveness but not freedom. And so I want to cover a couple different types of these grave clothes that might be wrapped around us and keeping us, hindering us, keeping us from actually moving forward into the fullness of the destiny that God has. You know, deliverance is actually not meant to be an end in itself. It's actually not meant to be an end in itself. It's actually more meant to be a beginning than it is meant to be an end. I mean, think about when God set the Israelites free from Egypt. That was a beginning. The end goal was that was that they would come to know him and worship him and serve him and take possession of the promised land that he had said belonged to them. 
But they couldn't get to the promised land if they were still bound in Egypt. They couldn't know God in the holiness like they were meant to if they were still bound in Egypt. Right? He said, let my people go that they may worship me. They couldn't possess the land if they were still bound. One of my favorite verses is Obadiah verse 17. Did you know there's a book of the Bible called Obadiah? There is. It's one chapter long. It's in the Old Testament. Joel, Amos, Obadiah. There it is. One of the minor prophets, right? Obadiah verse 17, it says this. On Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. And there shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. That is a verse right there. That's a sermon series. Come on now. One little verse. But did you notice there's a progression? It starts with deliverance, but deliverance leads to holiness. Holiness leads to possessing our possessions. That means walking in the inheritance that God has given us in Christ Jesus. We have a promised land. And it's not a physical land. It's a spiritual land. It's a, it's a spiritual inheritance. We have a promised land in Christ that we're meant to be walking in. But if we're still in bondage, if we're still in affliction, if we're still wrapped up in grave clothes, we, we, we struggle to get to that promised land. So I want to cover a couple areas of demonic influence that can be like those grave clothes holding us back, wrapping, wrapping around us. And I, 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 I touched on these a little bit last night, but I want to go a little bit deeper into these today. One of them is called bondage. It's a type of demonic influence, which means to be enslaved to something. To be, it's the opposite of freedom. It's the opposite of being free, is being bound. Right? So it means to be enslaved to something. It could be a sinful habit where you cannot seem to get freedom from an area of a sinful habit. It could be an addiction that is enslaving you. Now, obviously, we all have to overcome the flesh. We're called to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. Paul talks about the difference between that in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, the works of the flesh. And so we have to learn how to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. But in some situations, people are trying to walk in the Spirit and they're trying to overcome. And what they're dealing with is not just the flesh, but there's actually a demonic element, a demonic component that's keeping them enslaved to an area of sin. Did you know we are meant to be free from the power of sin? That's actually part of the gospel. It's a major part of our salvation. Is that, is that we're not just meant to be free from the penalty of sin, which is the guilt, but we're also meant to be free from the power of sin, the sinful nature, because we're given a new nature, we're given a new heart. Romans 6.14, it says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Under the grace of God, sin is not supposed to overpower us. That doesn't mean you're going to be a perfect person, but it means the pattern of our lives should be one of freedom. But sometimes people, their heart is really toward the Lord and they're, they're wanting to be free. They have a repentant heart, but they keep in this cycle of bondage, this cycle where they cannot seem to break free. Let me give you some examples. I'm going to share some testimonies in this, in this teaching because I, I, I want you to see it in real life. I want you to hear real stories of real life people that experience deliverance and freedom. I was speaking at a men's retreat a few years back. I was at a men's retreat, and the topic was on sexual purity, walking in freedom from sexual sin. And, and that was the theme of the, of the weekend, and I was one of the speakers. And I, I did a message on repentance and deliverance and how they, they really go together. And I, I was in, it was in the context of freedom from sexual sin was the, the context. And so I talked about, number one, the importance of repentance, that, yes, our heart, acts, we have to be, want to be free. Our heart has to be turned toward God. Getting caught and being sorry that you got caught is not the same as repentance, by the way. Did you know that? Sometimes people aren't actually repentant. They're just upset about the consequences. But, but they haven't got to that point of what the Bible calls godly sorrow that leads to repentance. 
Right? Not, not condemnation. That's the, that's the devil's counterfeit of conviction. Because condemnation gives you no hope of escape. It gives you no hope of forgiveness. It gives you no hope of freedom. But the Holy Spirit, when he convicts you, yes, he makes you aware of it. He produces a sorrow, but he always points you to Jesus who paid the price to set you free. Right? And so I talked about the need for repentance, but I also talked about the need for deliverance. And how, you know, the Bible, one of the words for demons is unclean spirits. They're unclean. And sometimes they try to drive people into the unclean behaviors of perversion or of lust or of pornography or of adultery or of other types of sexual sin, various types of, of sexual sin. And, and so I talked about how in some situations people's heart really is in that place of repentance, but they stay in this cycle because, because that, those chains need to be broken off. And after the message is over, I, I led a time of ministry and I led this group of maybe 25 men together in this retreat in this time of ministry. And I prayed over them. I led them through prayers of repentance and confessing of sin and turning to the Lord. And, and then I began to pray a prayer, prayer of deliverance over all of them. And then I began to lay hands and pray for some of them. And there was one, one young man I prayed for. And months later, he, he, he came up to me at a, at a church event. He, he goes to the church where where I serve as pastor, and um, months, months and months later, he, he was like, hey, Jake, do you remember when you prayed for me at the, you know, this men's event? And I was like, I, you know, I pray for so many people. I don't always remember every single thing. I was like, yeah, man, I, I don't know. I don't remember. He, you know, tell me more. He's like, yeah. He said, well, when you prayed for me, you commanded the spirit of you know, pornography and addiction to, to come out of my life. And when you did that, I felt like I got punched in the gut. He said he like kind of like, boom, like doubled over as if he had been don't worry, I don't punch anyone in the gut. So, um, so he, but he felt like if he'd been punched in the gut and he felt something leave him and come out of him. And he said, Jake, I, I had been addicted to pornography for over 10 years. Over 10 years, I had not been able to get free. And he'd been married, and, and he, he'd been married for 10 years at this point. And, he, and it was before his marriage is when it started, so it was over 10 years. And he said, I always had these cycles. I had sometimes a victory, but it kept falling, a victory and falling. I could never, you know, and it was having a, obviously a negative impact on our marriage and all this stuff, the shame and this, all this stuff. was. And, and he said, now this was months and months later, and he said, I have been set free from pornography ever since that time when you prayed and cast those spirits out of me. And he, and, and he, a year later, he came back to that same retreat to testify of being set free and have had one full year of not having one time of watching pornography. And, he, and, and so in, in his situation, he needed deliverance to experience the full aspect of freedom that God has for us. I have a lot of these testimonies in the, in the book, and... Um, I'm thinking of one that actually my sister wrote in. She wrote in, she, I added it to the, to the book as my sister's testimony. And she got delivered from an eating disorder where she had been in bondage to, to an eating disorder for several years, starting in middle school, then getting worse in high school and in college. And, and it just got to the point where this thing would just, she would just feel this presence come over her. She would describe it. Like she would just feel this thing just kind of take over her and just this compulsion to, to binge and purge and all this, you know, and, and she, she was so depressed and she was like, Lord, is this, how can I ever get out of this? Is this just, I'm stuck this way? I just, you know, and then as I was learning about deliverance, I began to share some of that and she began to see, you know, maybe there's a spiritual component to this. And so she began to pray. She began to stand against it spiritually. And, and God had to bring her to a point of true surrender and true, uh, just releasing it to him. But when she got to that point of true surrender and release, she was crying out to God and she woke up a couple hours later and had to throw up, but it wasn't sickness. She was, she was getting delivered, as she, and when she fell, she was getting delivered, and she just was heaving out these, you know, these spirits, and it literally, that was the change right there. It broke the chains of the eating disorder, and she was set free from that day. It's been 15 plus years, I don't know, I'm close to 20 years maybe now. <clears throat> she was set free. We've seen people delivered from drug addiction, substance abuse. Two of my good friends... They're, they serve at the church where I'm at. They, they went and ministered to it. They flew to Florida to pray for their good friend who had a heroin addiction of many years. He got radically delivered of hundreds of demons. He had a lot of demons. 
Um, and he got radically delivered, and he's been set free from heroin now for four or five years. Just incredible stuff, okay? So God is in the business of setting captives free. God is in the business of breaking chains of bondage. Let's get to another type of um, demonic influence, another type of grave clothe, and that is oppression. Demonic oppression is one of the ways that the devil wants to influence our lives. It says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it's giving like a little summary of the ministry of Jesus. It's the, the apostle Peter is preaching, and he gives this little summary. And he says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. All who were oppressed by the devil. That word oppressed, it means to exercise harsh control over. It's to be weighed down, to be pushed down, like a dark cloud. The Bible talks about in Isaiah 61, a spirit of heaviness. That's a spirit of despair. It's a spirit of darkness. It's a spirit of depression that tries to oppress people. There was a young lady that shared her, her story with me that um, this happened a year prior to her sharing it with me. Now, because I often minister in group settings like this, I don't always know all the details of what happens. And sometimes I hear testimonies years later. And it's always, it's, it's always incredible to hear what God does because, again, I don't always know all that's going on in every single situation. You know, last night many hands went up. It, it felt something leave them. And, um, and, and so when I, when I minister in groups, sometimes I don't, I don't always know. This, uh, this young lady came up to me after a church service one time, and she was like, Jake, I've been meaning to tell this to you. But about a year ago, I came to your church. It's called Threshold Church. I came to Threshold, and, um, and you happened to be leading a, a time of deliverance prayer that day. And, and she said, in the middle of the prayer time, you said, in the name of Jesus, I command the spirit of oppression to come out. And when you said that, I felt this spirit coming up and leaving me. And she said, for the couple years leading up to that time, that she had had dark depression and tormenting suicidal thoughts that were, that were afflicting her, that were oppressing her. And she said, when, when you commanded that spirit of oppression to come out, I felt this thing leave me, and I've been free from the depression and suicidal thoughts now. It had been a year. She was delivered from it. In that one moment, one moment, in a service like that. I'll never forget a powerful water baptism service we had. One summer, we had a water baptism service at a pond several years ago, and the Lord had put it on my heart that there was going to be deliverances that happened in the midst of water baptism. I'd never seen that happen at that point. I heard stories, and I just had this faith and belief that some people were going to get delivered during water baptism. Now, there was a woman who had contacted our church because she was neighbors with one of our leaders and she had been formerly a Muslim. She actually was born in the Middle East. She had come over as a, uh, as a refugee, and she was living in, in Lancaster, um, and she had come to the Lord. Some people had invited her to church, and she at first was resistant, and obviously being a Muslim, and, but the Lord began to soften her heart. She attended church one time and just started weeping. She had no idea why she was crying. It was the Holy Spirit just drawing her. She had a dream one night where she saw Jesus in a dream. She had a vision. The Lord, I mean, just incredible. And so she had given her life to Jesus, to follow Jesus. And now she wanted to get water baptized. How many know that's a big deal when someone from a Muslim background says they're getting water baptized? Because they know what that means. They know what that means. That's more. See, water baptism is, is more than just an empty ritual. It's meant to be a, a, it's an act of obedience to the Lord that says publicly, I'm following Jesus. I believe a spiritual transaction takes place. And, and so she said, I want to get water baptized. So I had a short phone conversation with her just to find out her, her story, her testimony. I said, absolutely, you can come. So she came to the water baptism. I hardly knew anything about her. But as I was beginning to pray over the people that were getting water baptized, she was in the front. There was about 15 or 20 people that were getting baptized. I began just to lead them in a prayer. I gave like a little short message. 
and I was leading them in a prayer just to, uh, just to commit their lives to Christ and to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And then we're going to go to the baptism. And as she's going through the prayer, she's praying along like everybody else. And all of a sudden I notice she starts to close her eyes and kind of shake her head like this. And I see tears coming down her eyes. And I could tell there was a struggle going on and that, that she was battling something. And so it just, it, I just kind of registered that to remember when I prayed for her. Now, she told me later, I didn't know this at the time, but she told me that from the time she was a teenager, she'd been oppressed by a demon that had visited her, that had tormented her, that had afflicted her, and had oppressed her. And her parents, you know, would try to get help for her. They would take her to these different places, and, and no one could help her. No one could bring freedom. No one could, could change what was going on. And so this demon had been haunting her and oppressing her for all these years. And now she's standing there, getting ready to get baptized. And while she's praying through the prayer, this demon begins to speak in her mind. She starts to hear this voice saying, what are you doing here? Get out of here. You're going to go to hell if you do this. Go back to Islam. You're not supposed to do this. You're not, he's, she's this voice is going on. So she's like wrestling through, trying to figure out what's going on. And she steps into the waters to get baptized. She was one of the third or fourth ones that came in to get baptized. I just put my hand on her shoulder. I began to pray. I began to break the power of Satan from off her life. I began to break any generational curses and influences. I began to come in. And all of a sudden, she begins to shake. She begins to tremble. And she all of a sudden just whipped her hand way up in the air and began to shriek. Just let out this long cry, this long shriek. And this demon just, just came out of her. And I was like, come on. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and after the whole thing was, I mean, there was a couple hundred people there and just, you know, a lot of people were familiar with deliverance because I taught it at our church, but a lot of people were there to, you know, as a guest to, you know, maybe their son or daughter was getting baptized or a relative. And so it was kind of like this, whoa, what in the world just happened there? What, what, what's going on here? This is, you know, and so I, I talked to her afterwards, made sure she was okay, found out more. And then that's when I found out the backstory and what was going on. She came to our church the next week and just shared her testimony. Oh, it was so powerful just, you know, sharing in broken English her whole story and how Jesus had set her free. There, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. The place just erupted in praise. One encounter with the resurrected Jesus. One encounter with Jesus set her free from years of oppression. You know, I said this last night, but sometimes we can come under demonic oppression because not of the choices we've made, but because of abuse we've endured. You know, sometimes we get, we, we get into bondage because we've, we've fallen into sin and we, we've made choices and we've, we've gone after things. We've rebelled against God's word. Or we've, you know, but sometimes we can be a captive. We can be taken captive by the enemy because we've experienced abuse and traumatic experiences. And if that's you tonight, I believe God has healing to heal your heart and to bring deliverance from that oppression that's trying to hold you captive to the past, hold you captive to memories and traumatic experiences. He wants to release you from that. Now, another area, another type of grave clothes is torment. That's one of the characteristic activities of evil spirits is that they want to actually bring torment Luke 6, 18. Luke 6, verse 18 gives just a little insight into this. And it talks about how there was crowds of people that were coming to Jesus to be healed, but also to be delivered. It says, who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And then verse 18, as well as those who were tormented, by unclean spirits, and they were healed. Healed of their diseases, but also those who were tormented. That word tormented means to be troubled, to be vexed, to be disturbed, tortured, right? All these different words, to be tormented. And the, the primary target of the enemy's torment is our minds. That's where the enemy wants to bring torment. Sometimes it's crippling fear or anxiety. You know that, sp that fear can be a spirit. Did you know that? Fear can be a natural human emotion. That's absolutely true. We can experience fear just as a natural human emotion, a natural human response. But fear can also be a demonic spirit. 
Paul taught, he said, he told Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So when it's crippling, when it's controlling, when it's tormenting, crippling anxiety, sometimes it's confusion. The torment can be confusion. Sometimes it's self-destructive behavior. In Luke chapter 5, or I mean, sorry, Mark chapter 5, there was the man that had the legion of demons and said he was cutting himself, he was harming himself. And sometimes when people have maybe suicidal tendencies or thoughts or compulsions, like the boy in Mark 9, he was throwing himself into the water, throwing himself into the fire because a demonic spirit was trying to, to torture him. It can be suicidal thoughts. It can be condemnation and just this irrational um, fear of being lost when you're actually saved, but you just you believe you just believe you can't be forgiven, or you believe that God could just never forgive this one sin or this something that you've done in the past. And there's a lying spirit just driving that into your mind. I've seen people set free from insomnia or sleeping issues where they're being tormented in the night. So all all types of torment can actually have a demonic origin. And, and so I think as, as the church, it's so important for the church to embrace this and to, to address the spiritual side of these types of issues. Not everything is spiritual. Not everything is demonic. There can be physical issues. There can be issues that are purely physiological. But at the same time, there can be many issues that actually have a demonic element. And if we don't address the demonic component, then the true healing and freedom won't come. Because the fact is, you can't counsel out a demon. Now, some, some things need counseling, and some things need deliverance. They both can be valid, right? But as the church, we, we, we can't allow this stigma about this topic to keep us from, from addressing this. And I said this last night. It doesn't mean you're an evil person if you need deliverance from an evil spirit. There's no shame that has to be attached to it. The Bible talks about it openly and plainly. It describes these people that were set free. You know, we know Mary Magdalene as the one out of whom had come seven demons. It just was just put in there, just put in the, in the record of Scripture. And yet Mary Magdalene was the first witness of the resurrection of Jesus. Come on. There's no shame in needing deliverance. Mary Magdalene was part of his apostolic team. She traveled with him from place to place with many others. So it's not like, oh no, you had a demon. Oh no, you were delivered. We can't, no, it's not like that at all. There's no shame in this. So torment. There was a lady who came to one of my meetings in the Lancaster area a couple years ago. I, I had never met her before, and uh, pretty pretty amazing story. But she she had been under um, anxiety and depression were the two areas that she was really fighting with, and so so she she had had some grief happen in her life. Her uh, one of her best friends had died very kind of unexpectedly, kind of happened quickly. It was it was a battle with cancer, but it just kind of really happened very quickly. And then she had other issues that were going on, and other just tr kind of traumatic events that were just that just kind of drew her into a place where there was anxiety where there was just this depression that was that was coming and and so she was just trying to get her her walk with God in a, in, a, in a deeper place and just really try to find her identity in the Lord and she was praying for healing she was praying for freedom and her mom called her one day and said I was praying for you and God gave me a name Jake Kale and so she looked up my name, and she found me on Facebook, and she saw that I was going to be speaking at her, in her area, uh, at, at this house of prayer called Gateway House of Prayer in her area. And so she was like, well, I'm, going to go to his, I'm going to go to his meeting. So her and her husband came to the meeting. She came to the meeting, and I, I did a message on breaking the power of word curses, breaking the power of destructive words, and how demonic influences can come through different types of destructive words. And at the end, I was doing the prayer of deliverance, like I always do, just leading the prayer. 
And, and she was just, you know, crying out to God. Her heart was so hungry and desperate. And she was in tears just saying, God, show me this is real. Show me that what's happening here is actually real. And I'm going to be changed. And I'm not going to be the same. And, and, and within seconds of that, the Holy Spirit highlighted her to me. I didn't even know her name. I just said, excuse me, ma'am, what's your name? And I began to prophesy over her. I began to speak over her. And I began to speak all that she had been going through and the grief and the, the sorrow and the, the, the trauma. And began to pray over her, speak blessing and break off the demonic from her life. And, and she was set free that day from the depression, from the anxiety. She was set free from it that day. She reached out to me later to share, to share the testimony. Another service at that same place, there was a, a young lady who goes to our church and through, through a series of events that happened, she, she came under this fear of death. You know, there's a spirit called a spirit of death. And, and what it does is it tries to get you to either, one, have an have a irrational fear of death or to get you to believe that you're going to die soon. Or, you know, so um, what, one of the symptoms that might happen is you might begin to envision yourself dying. You might see yourself getting into a car crash. You might just, all, all just believe you're going to die any day or it's your time now. Or, um, and, and, and she had to, she, but for her, she had this irrational fear. She had a fear that her husband was going to die. It was a tormenting fear Every, every time her husband left in the morning to go to work, she thought, this is the last time I'm going to see him. It's, it's, it's just this tormenting fear that was in her mind that was going on. And uh, she came to the deliverance service, not for herself. She brought somebody else to get delivered. <laughs> she brought a friend that needed freedom, had been, under, been, been through horrible abuse, and, um, and she brought her friend. But during the corporate ministry time, at one point, I called out the spirit of death. I said, I command the spirit of death and the spirit of the fear of death to come out in Jesus' name. And she, again, just, boom, just like fell, fell forward and just felt this thing breaking off and felt this thing leaving her. And she was instantly delivered from the torment, from the torment in her mind. So we can be free from torment. God wants us to walk in peace. He wants us to learn how to take thoughts captive. Did you know that not every thought you have is your own? Did you know that? Did you know that you can actually also learn to walk in authority over your mind, take dominion over your thought life? Okay, that's more tomorrow. I'm getting, getting ahead of myself. Tomorrow morning, I'm, I'm going to talk about getting established in freedom, how to walk in your freedom, how to live in that freedom, all right? Um, another area. Oh boy, it looks like I'm past my time. There's a little thing covering the, the, um, the, uh, the time, but I can tell I'm a little bit past. So we're going to get to the ministry time pretty soon. You guys doing all right? You guys good? I want to cover another area of uh, grave clothes, another area of demonic influence, and that is infirmity or affliction. Infirmity or affliction. In Luke chapter 13 is a prime example of a person who was oppressed or tormented or afflicted physically, but it had a demonic origin. Luke chapter 10, or 13, verse 10, it said that Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. He laid his hands on her. Immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And then the leader of the synagogue is mad because it was a Sabbath day. Can you believe this? I mean, here this woman had been tormented by this, afflicted by this, you know, sickness, this pain, her, ba her back was crippled, it was a crippling spirit, and she couldn't raise herself up. 18 years, and all the, all the synagogue ruler could be, be was mad, because they thought it violated the Sabbath, which it didn't. It just violated their version of it. So oftentimes we see in the Gospels that physical symptoms can have a spiritual origin. A physical condition can have a spiritual root. Now, if this woman would have been alive today and she would have gone to the doctor, they probably would have diagnosed her with something. 
they probably would have said, you have a real severe case of scoliosis. You know, your back is, is, is curved. There's a severe curvature of your spine. It's scoliosis. She probably would have gotten a, a, a diagnosis. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus just said it was a spirit that was causing the problem. And after she was set free and the, and, the, and the synagogue leaders are all mad at him, he said, should not this woman, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 years, should she not be set free on the Sabbath from her bondage? So he said that Satan kept her bound. I believe we need to view sickness as an enemy. I believe we need to view sickness as an enemy. And I also believe we need to understand that it's possible for evil spirits to be the source of sickness. There was times when Jesus healed the deaf by casting out a demon. There was times where Jesus healed the blind by casting out a spirit. Jesus healed a boy that had epileptic seizures by casting out a spirit. Now, Jesus also sometimes healed the deaf by putting his finger in the ear and saying, Be opened. Sometimes he healed the blind man. He, he put mud on the spit, put spit in the mud and put in his eye, right? So he didn't always do it the same way. And so we do need discernment. We do need to be aware uh, that not everything's caused by a demon, but some things are caused by a demon. And so, but um, sometimes evil spirits can be the source of a sickness. Now, especially when it's something that is undiagnosable or it's like this mysterious type of illness, or sometimes if the pain moves around in the body, that's, that could be an indication. Th those can be indications that it could be a spiritual root. Sometimes the Holy Spirit can just show us what it is. But I've seen various healings happen when, when, when a person was delivered from an evil spirit. There was a lady that I went to go to her house to pray for, and she had been in and out of a wheelchair. She had been not able, she had these various types of diagnoses, and I couldn't even attempt to say the names of these sicknesses. I'd be speaking in tongues if I tried, literally. It was like these long names of these, like, you know, I don't know what, what they were. Now, one of them was like Lyme disease, but all the other ones were these just long names. But they were all type of like autoimmune type things and where her body was like turning against her. And these things were happening and it was progressing and getting worse. And she had, I think, three young children and she had a home business that she was trying to run. And now she wasn't able to function like this. And she had been, she had, you know, when, when I walked into the house, she looked like death, pale. I mean, just, just looked very, very ill. Again, sometimes she was confined to a wheelchair, couldn't function, couldn't drive, couldn't do errands. Couldn't walk up the steps without severe pain. And so I began talking to her and her husband, asking questions. And deliverance was brand new to them. But as I was talking to her, I found out that her father had been heavily involved in the occult. He had been very much into witchcraft. He was a warlock. He, he was into dark stuff, demonic stuff. And actually, she hadn't seen him from, from the time she was seven years old. Her mom took her and re fled from him and all that was going on. And then he had passed away at some point. So I'm like, wow, there was a lot of, there could be open doors there with the, the, the history of just dark stuff that was going on in that family. And I, so I said, you know, would you be open to praying through some prayers of deliverance? I began to lead her through some prayers of deliverance and releasing forgiveness. And she begins to cry and just experience some healing in her heart. And, and there wasn't any dramatic manifestations, but you could tell things were happening. You could tell God was moving. I was commanding spirits to come out. And, and after a while of praying, uh, I said, well, why don't you just walk around? Let's just kind of test this out and see how it's going. And she just began to walk around the house. She began to move around. And she wasn't saying a whole lot, but she was just kind of walking, walking around. And then she gets to the stairs. She begins to walk up the stairs. She gets to the top of the steps, and she just starts weeping. Not because of pain, not because of sorrow, but because she was healed. And she had not been able to walk up steps without pain like that for I don't know how long, months, years. I can't remember how long it was. And she's just weeping in tears. I texted her the next day to say, hey, how, how are you doing? What's going on? She sends me this long text. Well, I woke up this morning. I put my makeup on. I got in the car. I took my sons to do this. I went to the grocery store. I, she's naming all these things. I'm like, that is amazing. That is amazing. But her healing came through deliverance when she was set free. Now, one more bonus. This is a bonus. I wasn't going to, I wasn't. I was like weighing between a couple different messages tonight and praying into it. And um, 
I almost did a whole message tonight on generational curses and strongholds. I wanted to kind of bring a little bit of that, but, um, but I felt led to go this direction with this, this message. But I, but I want to mention it real quick because I want to go into the ministry time and I want to pray through that. What is a generational stronghold? What is a generational curse? Well, simply put, it is a stronghold or a, um, a destructive behavior or a pattern that simply travels through a family line from one generation to the next. And I, I have a whole chapter on this in the, in the book I wrote out there, um, and I, I can't get into the whole thing right now, but just except to say that, yes, these are very real. These can be very real where there can be patterns that get passed down. Sometimes it's sinful strongholds. And you can kind of even, you can see scriptural examples of people, like for instance, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, the, are our forefathers of the faith. And they're, they're, we, we hold them in high esteem as we should, right? But even Abraham had this little thing in his life where he, where he would deceive the king and say, well, Sarah is just my, she's my sister. Remember that? Remember that story? And then it kind of got him into trouble, and then the king you know, tried to take her, the wife, and then God had to rebuke the king, and there's all this crazy stuff. But what's fascinating is that the next generation, years and years later, Isaac with Rebekah did the same exact thing. It's almost like you're watching a rerun. It's almost like the same story. Like, wait a second, did that just happen? Like, it's like the same exact pattern. You're like, wow, right? Abraham did it. Isaac did it. And then Jacob, what was his downfall, right? Deception, deceit, to, to steal the, the birthright, right? To, to take the blessing, to deceive, right? We see that. We can see patterns like that. We can see examples, and there's different types of generational, you know, curses that can pass down. Sometimes it's sinful areas. Sometimes it's even sicknesses and, and mental issues that can get passed down. Doctors know this. They just don't know to call it generational curse or a stronghold. They don't know the spiritual side of it necessarily. But what's the first thing you do at a doctor's office? You fill out your family history, right? So I've seen people healed of physical issues when they were delivered from a generational curse. One lady in one of my meetings had debilitating de headaches for seven years, had to take pain medication every day. And while I was teaching on this topic, she realized, oh, my dad had the same thing. Oh, my granddad had the same thing. In the prayer, we prayed to break it off. She was healed completely from it. And so in some situations, a generational stronghold could be like a root beneath the surface that's causing bad fruit above the surface. And I'm only just giving this short, short explanation of this now because when we go into the ministry time, I want to really pray through that. Because we didn't really pray through that last night in the ministry time. We prayed through other things. And we're, we're going to go through a prayer again. But I want, to, I want to cover that. In Galatians 3, verse 13 and 14, it says that Christ has become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that Jesus has become a curse for us, that we might be redeemed from the curse of the law, that we might inherit God's blessing. So one of the things that Jesus accomplished on the cross was to become a curse so that we could be delivered from the curse. And that includes any generational curse where it talks about you know, the iniquities visiting the children from one generation to the next. That's part of the curse of the law. In Christ, we are redeemed from the curse of the law. So this is a real topic, but no believer needs to stay under any generational curse. And I've seen people, again, set free of many areas when those were broken. And I don't make a formula out of any of these things, right? There's different facets and factors in our, in our freedom when it comes to removing the grave clothes. But that can be one of those areas. I want us to stand to our feet because I want to really just go into the time of ministry here. I'd love to have, Stephen, yeah, I'd love to have just a background music on the keys. would be great. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yep. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Guitar is great, too. So what I want to do is, now, if you were here last night, this is going to be a similar time of corporate ministry where I'm going to lead us through a prayer to submit ourselves to God and to resist the devil. A prayer of deliverance. We're going to cover certain areas. 
Sometimes it's a need for repentance, of turning our hearts to God, turning away from sin, confessing of sin, walking in the light. Sometimes it's a need to forgive others who have hurt us or wronged us, to release forgiveness, to extend that. Sometimes it's a need to renounce any involvement in dark practices or occultic activities. And we covered those last night. And so we're gonna, we're gonna cover those again today, probably a little quicker than last night, but then we're gonna really cover the generational issue too, breaking off any areas of strongholds, things that have been patterns in the family line, that have maybe followed your family line. And for some people, that's why you're in such a battle. Some people end up in the battle of their life because not only are you fighting for yourself, you're fighting for future generations. Some people are a transition point in a family line. A transition point in a family line where it stops with you. Where it ran in your family until it got to you. It ran in your family, but not anymore. Amen. Amen. And you know what's so amazing is that the strongholds that you overcome, your children do not have to fight the same way that you did. The land that you take possession of, your children get to inherit. And we're going to break those curses tonight. We're going to pray to break the strongholds, to uproot those areas. I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Let's just begin to pray for a couple minutes right now. Let's just begin to ask the Holy Spirit to move right now. Let's just begin to lift up our voices, begin to give him thanks, begin to give him praise. Come on, let's not be shy. I just want you to begin to pray right now. Let's just turn this into a prayer meeting for a couple minutes. Just begin to pray out right now. Begin to honor him, begin to worship him right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We exalt you, Jesus. We fix our eyes upon you. You are the deliverer, Jesus. You are the healer, God. It's because of your work, Lord, that we can be set free, God. It's not because of our own merits, Lord. It's not because of our own works, Lord. It's by your grace that we're saved. It's by your grace that we're delivered. And so, Father, right now, let your Holy Spirit fall in this place, God. In the name of Jesus, God, let your spirit begin to fall in this place, God. Begin to move through this time, God. I declare the kingdom of heaven is at hand in this room right now. Lord, your kingdom come right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, let your holy angels be released, Father, to minister in this room, Lord. I release the anointing that breaks every yoke today in Jesus' name. I thank you that bondages are broken tonight, God. I thank you that chains are loosed, Father, that prison doors are opened up in the name of Jesus. I thank you that all oppression lifts off tonight in Jesus' name. And that every generational curse, Lord, is cut off, cut off by the power of the blood of Jesus tonight. We honor you, God, and we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to do the work, to do the work that only you can do. We thank you, God. Now, I want you to follow along with me as we pray. I want to lead us through this this prayer. I want you to pray this out loud together. I want you to speak this with faith. There's such a unity of just corporate anointing and faith when we join together in unity. I want us to speak these words out with faith in who Jesus is and what he's done. So walk with me through this time here. Say this out. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace to me. I thank you for your love for me. That you sent your Son to die for me. I ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon me to minister freedom to me and to completely deliver me in the name of Jesus. I worship you, God. I honor you, God. You're the one true living God. Lord Jesus Christ, I look to you as my only Savior, as my only Deliverer, as my only Healer. And I declare that Jesus, you are my Lord. I believe that you came in the flesh, that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you rose from the dead. I submit myself to you, God, and I take an active stand against Satan and every one of his demons. I turn my heart to you, Lord, repenting of any sin. 
Now, we're gonna, I'm just going to give you a couple minutes, and I want you just to deal with any areas that God might be putting on your heart, any areas that, of, of sin that you might need to confess, any areas of people that you might need to forgive. You can just verbalize that. Just say, Jesus, I choose to forgive and speak their names out. Any things, practices that you need to cut off and renounce. Just take a couple minutes right now before we get into the generational curses area. Just begin to speak those things out right now. Begin to confess those sins to the Lord. Begin to turn to him right now. I'm just going to give you some time and space as Stephen plays in the background. Thank you, Lord. Verbalize your heart to God right now. Just verbalize your heart yielding to Him, turning to Him, turning away from darkness, turning to His light, turning away from sin, receiving His righteousness. It's because of Him. It's because of Him. It's because of Him. We need you, Jesus. We can't do it in our own strength, God. We need you. We need your grace. Release your grace, Father. Pour out your spirit tonight. Thank you, Father. Just, just another minute here. through this time of just really going after this area of breaking off any of those generational influences that have tried to follow us down. And at some point in that, in that prayer, there's going to be a time where you can even name some specific things. Or if you know there's been certain patterns that have kind of just traveled through addictions or destructive behaviors, sexual immorality that just seems to be a pattern, or maybe there's been suicide or adultery, different areas like that. Maybe there's been illnesses or physical conditions that you've seen, just a pattern of. We want to break those off tonight in the name of Jesus. So I want you to begin to pray this out with me here. This is based on that Galatians 3 passage that I just mentioned earlier. Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and becoming a curse so that I could be redeemed from every curse and receive God's blessing as a child of God. Because of your finished work, I ask you to set me free from every curse that is over my life. I renounce the sins of previous generations and I break away from every generational curse from every generational stronghold that is over my life. Specifically, I break free from. And I'll take time right here in these next couple minutes, just name some of those patterns. Thank you, God. We just renounce, Lord, these patterns. We renounce these strongholds, God. They don't belong to us anymore. God, we're a new creation in Christ. Just take the next minute or so, just name those things. Thank you, Jesus. seconds here. Just name anything you need to name. Just release those things. Renounce those areas. Thank you, Father.
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's say this out. Let's make this declaration here. I declare that the blood of Jesus separates me from the sins and the curses of my family line. And I renounce every evil spirit that's associated with my family line or that's come through the generational line. And I declare that Jesus Christ is my Lord. And by the authority of Jesus' name, I command every unclean spirit that has any influence in my life to come out right now. Go in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now I want you just to posture your heart in a receiving posture as I begin to pray. If you want to lift your hands up to the Lord right now for a couple minutes as I begin to pray. Father, let the power of the Holy Spirit fall in this room. Let the power of the Holy Spirit fall in this room, God. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit move through this place, God. Burning up, Lord, every generational curse, God. Uprooting every, every generational curse right now. In the name of Jesus, I command every unclean spirit, come out from the people right now. In the name of Jesus, I command every demon that's influencing the people in this room, come out in the name of Jesus. Come out in the name of Jesus right now. I break your power. I break your authority. You have no authority in this place. I command you by the name of Jesus Christ, go from the people, go from the people, out right now in Jesus' name. I take authority over every spirit that came through the family line. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of witchcraft that came through the family line comes out right now, comes out right now, comes out right now in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of idolatry that came through the family line comes out right now, comes out in the name of Jesus. It leaves you now, it leaves you now, it leaves you now in Jesus' name. I command every spirit of infirmity that came through the family line, come out in the name of Jesus. Spirit of affliction, come out in Jesus' name. Spirit of infirmity, come out in the name of Jesus. Spirit of pain, come out in the name of Jesus right now. Go, 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 go. Leave the people now. Leave the people now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Let's just stay in this place for a few more, probably several more minutes here. It's going to flow through some of these areas. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. Some of you are feeling stuff happening and moving. Some of you might be feeling stuff leaving. Just cooperate with what Jesus is doing. Just keep your eyes on him. He's a deliverer. He's walking you through. I thank you, Jesus. Would you walk through this room, Lord Jesus? Would you move through this place? In the name of Jesus, I take authority over every spirit of bondage, every spirit that keeps people enslaved. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ right now. Every spirit that tries to keep people enslaved, come out in Jesus' name. I break the spirit of addiction. Spirit of addiction, come out now in the name of Jesus. Go, leave them right now in Jesus' name. I break the power of every addiction to pornography. Come out in the name of Jesus. I rebuke every spirit of pornography. Come out in Jesus' name. Any spirit of lust or perversion, out from the people, out from the people, out from the people. Now, go from them in Jesus' name. I send you away. I break the power of any addiction to substances of alcohol or drug abuse. I say, come out in the name of Jesus. Go from the people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I command that spirit of oppression to come out from the people right now in Jesus' name. Spirit of oppression, come out in Jesus' name. Spirit of heaviness, come out. Come out in Jesus' name. You spirit of despair and depression, come out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I command you to go right now in Jesus' name. I rebuke the spirit of anxiety. Spirit of anxiety comes out right now in Jesus' name. It goes from the people, out of the people right now. Spirit of fear, come out in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, I take authority 
over the spirit of torment. Spirit of torment. I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come out right now in Jesus' name. Out right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. It leaves you right now. It leaves you right now in Jesus' name. It goes out from you right now in the name of Jesus. Torment is broken in Jesus' name. It goes out, 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 out in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. It goes out right now. It goes out right now. Spirit of condemnation, come out in Jesus' name. Go, go, go. I command you to get out by the authority of Jesus' name right now. I command every spirit of mental torment that brings mental torment. Come out in the name of the Lord Jesus. I break the curse of mental illness. Be broken in Jesus' name. Be broken in the name of Jesus. Every spirit connected to bipolar, come out in Jesus' name. Every spirit connected to depression goes out in the name of Jesus. Go, go, go. I command you to leave in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, I bless what you're doing in this room. Lord, would you continue to move by your spirit? Would you move by your grace, Lord? Would you walk through this place? God, pour out your spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit, God. Fill the hearts of people with your love, God. Fill the hearts of people, Lord. Let it be encounters with you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. This woman right here, I'm pointing, I just want to, would you put your hands up right now? Yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless what you're doing, Lord, in this woman over here. I break the power of the lying spirit right now, that spirit that has lied to you in your mind about your identity. I break it from your life right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. I unbind it from your personality. I command it to come out, leave right now in the name of Jesus. I speak to that lying spirit. I say, be muzzled, be silenced in the name of Jesus. I command you to go from her life in the name of Jesus. You leave her. I break the power of that spirit of rejection that tried to come into your life at a young age. I break its influence from your life. I command it to leave you now, to come out, to come out, to come out in Jesus' name. Every spirit that came through a traumatic event goes right now, out from your life, out right now, out right now. It's leaving you right now in Jesus' name. And I declare that anxiety shall no longer have control in your heart any longer and that the peace of God will rule and reign in your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I bless you in the name of Jesus for the Father's blessing to come upon you. And the, I pray the revelation, God, of the love of the Father pouring into her heart right now, Father, and establishing her, rooting her, grounding her in your love. Lord, I bless what you're doing right now. I declare you are set free in the name of Jesus right now. You are set free in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father. 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 God, let the fire of the Holy Spirit just move right now through this place. The fire of your love, God, of your presence, God, of your glory. Lord, right now, I just pray for a wave of your anointing for healing to flow through this room. Lord, you're anointing for healing. Lord, for physical healing, also for emotional healing. Lord, healing of the broken heart. Jesus, it says you were anointed and sent to bind up the brokenhearted. And right now, I just pray a release of that same anointing, Lord, to move through the hearts of people to bind up the brokenness, to, to bring, restore hearts that have been crushed, bruised, fractured. I declare wholeness, Lord, wholeness to come, Lord. Peace, wholeness over your hearts, over your minds. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I take authority over every evil spirit that came through trauma or abuse. I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, come out right now in Jesus' name. Out from the people in Jesus' name. I break the power of word curses and destructive words that were spoken over your life. I break the power of those word curses right now in the name of Jesus. Come out in Jesus' name. I command every spirit attached to a word curse, come out, leave right now in the name of Jesus. I uproot you from their soul. I uproot you from their soul. I uproot you from their soul right now in the name of Jesus. You leave the people, leave the people, leave the people. Lord, let your, let your spirit be like a river washing through the hearts right now, washing through, washing through. Thank you, Father. 
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, thank you. You are moving in our midst. You're moving in our midst. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Come, Holy Spirit. Do what you can do what only you can do, God. Thank you, Father. Let's pause for a minute. I just want to check in, see how everyone's doing. You guys doing all right? You guys doing okay out there? Thank you, Lord. I just want to just check and see how, how God's moving in this place. And just, uh, I, I ask this every time I do a group session like this. I did it last night. just want to know how many people you've actually experienced a deliverance. You felt something coming out of you or leaving you or lifting off you. Would you just put your, hand up, would you put your hands up real high? Would you put your hands up real high and just kind of wave them around? Just kind of move them around? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Can we just give Jesus praise? Let's give Jesus praise. It's awesome. It's awesome. I'm going to pray for maybe one or two minutes over the group, and then we're going to begin to transition. We'll have a, have a dismissal, and anyone that wants to stay and remain for more individual ministry, we'll, we'll do that here in just a, a minute. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you. We thank you, God. Let your Holy Spirit fall, God. Thank you for how you're moving. Thank you for how you're releasing your grace, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Release your power. Release your power in the name of Jesus. I take authority over the spirit of death. Spirit of death, come out in the name of Jesus right now. Go out from the people in Jesus' name. I rebuke the spirit of suicide. Spirit of suicide, come out from the people right now in the name of Jesus. Out right now. Go from the people. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke the spirit of anger. Spirit of anger, come out from the people right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every spirit of rage and anger and hatred, I say, come out from the people. Go out from them now. Leave them in Jesus' name. I command you to get out in the name of Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, Spirit of God, would you move? Do your work, Jesus. Do your work, Jesus. Release your grace. Release your grace. Release your love, God. Release your anointing, your power, your peace. Thank you, God. You're faithful. You're faithful. You're faithful. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Come, Holy Spirit. I take authority over the spirit of rejection. Spirit of rejection. Come out now in Jesus' name. Go out from the people. Out from the people. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. I want you just to put your hand over your heart. I just want to pray a prayer of just kind of closing down this corporate ministry. Just put your hand over your heart and just pray this out after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love for me. I thank you for freedom in Christ Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for your finished work. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit lives inside of me. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let every area of my life be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. I yield my life to you, Jesus. I follow you. I want to know you more. I want to grow in you more. I want to walk in your ways. I ask you to continue to lead me into the fullness of your freedom into your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's just give the Lord a clap of praise again. Just honor him. Thank you, Lord. Just, let's just praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. We honor you, God. We honor you, Jesus. We worship you, God. We say, worthy is the lamb. You are good, God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.